Well, folks, good evening to you all. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, as always, great to, to see you. Good to have you with us. And um, for me, nice to be back. I was preaching in Elgin this morning, and um, someone said they missed me, which was nice. I missed you as well. Uh, nice to see you. Just a few announcements, as usual, to give. Um, bear in mind the white sheet, of course, which guides you through the service. Bear in mind the blue sheet, which guides you through the week ahead and various other things. In fact, not just the week ahead, but if you open it up, um, you'll see there we, we've put in some summer dates. Uh, so as with many things, uh, some stuff slows down or takes a break or kind of has changes over the summer. Uh, so you'll see there uh, everything that's happening uh, and by process of elimination, everything that's not happening as well uh, in, in July and summer of August. So you can pin that on the fridge and, and uh, follow it along as you go. Uh, let me just mention one thing for this week, which is that this Wednesday, we, wouldn't, we would be due to have our, um, our prayer cafe, our sort of main central midweek prayer meeting. Normally that would be here, uh, but this week we're, we're joining together with uh, Elgin Free Church. We're going to have a joint time of prayer, and uh, on this occasion we're going to do that in Elgin. So um, Elgin Free Church, this Wednesday, 7.30 p.m., and um, let me just say, please do come if you can. Um, lots of you would normally be here. Um, please do join us in Elgin. Um, if we can offer each other lifts, help folks to get there, that would be really good. It would be a great encouragement for the Elgin congregation as we continue to think uh, and look towards linkage. Uh, if you can be with us to pray on Wednesday. Uh, next Sunday, that's the 26th, weather dependent, and I say that because of how, it's, uh, how it looks out the window today. Weather dependent, we'll have our outdoor service in the community garden. That's 11 a.m. next Sunday uh, in the community garden. We will, if for some reason the weather isn't good, we will communicate as best we can and we'll be in here. So if for some reason you go to the community garden and we're not there, well, we'll be in here. But all being well, uh, we'll be uh, outside. And that will be an invitation service as well. We're going to take a break from our um, Isaiah series. It'll be uh, a one-off uh, sermon I'll be preaching, and it'll be uh, good for us all, but, also, but especially good for folks who wouldn't normally be in church. And maybe there are people who would find it hard to walk in this building, but might find it easier to come along to the community garden. So uh, bear that in mind, pray, think, and invite. Uh, last of all, I know some of you heard this this morning, but just to repeat, uh, you've got a couple of extra things tucked inside your little bundle of stuff on the way in. Um, and I mention this again because um, even if you, you're not with us normally on a Sunday morning, but just a Sunday evening, this is relevant for you. So two things, you've got um, an, an Elgin and Burghead Church survey. Um, we'd love it if every one of us would, would fill this in. Um, it asks various questions um, about our congregation here in Burghead. We'd love to know your thoughts. What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What ideas do you have for the future for ministry? And then more specifically, of course, looking forward to um, our linkage with Elgin. Um, it asks a specific question about Sunday services. What should we do with them? How should they, uh, what times should they be at? It gives a few options. You can tell us what you think of them. You can say you think they're all rubbish and you want to give us a different suggestion if you want. Uh, plenty of space for you to do that, so we'd love to hear from you. And then the second thing in that bundle is uh, what we're calling a roadmap, which really does what it says on the tin. Uh, now, uh, it's written on paper, not in, not in stone, so it's possible one or two things might change. But basically, this is our plan <clears throat> for the next uh, almost a year through to April next year uh, in terms of uh, events uh, that that relate to the linking of the two congregations. You'll see things there like uh, joint prayer meetings and so on, all sorts of things. Um, just bear in mind, uh, as Davi said this morning, that some of those events, excuse me, <coughs> relate just to the Elgin end of things. We've got a few vision afternoons in Elgin, for example, uh, but many of them are for us as well. And uh, even if they're more at the Elgin end of things, it's good for us to be aware of them. Uh, so uh, you can take that away as well going to have a busy fridge where you pin all these things uh, or something like that. Uh, last of all, one final announcement, uh, which is to do with free church youth camps. It's also from me, but it's on the screen. So here we go. Hi, folks. I want to speak to you about free church youth camps. For decades, youth camps have been a really key way to share the gospel and to disciple 
children and young people from across our denomination and from across Scotland. For many years, uh, congregations have supported these camps to enable them to happen. That's involved lots of things, sending volunteers, helpers, leaders, cooks, and also giving money uh, to enable the camps to happen. We as a congregation have been invited this year to partner with uh, one of the camps happening in Oswestry. And one of the reasons for that is that Davi and Emma de Paola are going to be leaders on that camp. We've been asked if we can help to raise money to um, go towards the cost of that camp, specifically uh, towards funding uh, Davi and Emma to go there and to be leaders. Um, our task is to, uh, to give £670 to make that possible for the week, which is a really important thing and will be really helpful to the many children and young people on that camp. Uh, now, our finance committee has committed to, to covering that cost, but we thought it would be good to um, open it up to the congregation here and ask, uh, would you like to make uh, a special one-off donation uh, to help this happen? And so over the next two or three weeks, uh, if you'd like to do that, to help us raise that £670, uh, then you can uh, just uh, put a donation in the box and uh, just, just mark it Youth Camps um, or pass it on to Chris, um, either online, just as long as your donation is marked uh, for Youth Camps. Uh, thanks so much. We'll let you know uh, what we raise and um, we hope and we pray that the Lord will use uh, that particular camp down in Oswestry and uh, Davy and Emma and all the other leaders and helpers uh, for his glory and uh, to help uh, share the gospel and disciple uh, children and young people. So please do give over the next two or three weeks and mark those donations for youth camps. Thank you. Let's pray, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, thank you that you are present with us as we gather in your name and around your word. Lord, open our lips, we pray. Enable us, we pray, to praise you, to worship you. Help us to come to you in prayer. Help us to sit humbly under the teaching of your word. And we pray that all we do would be for our good and for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to these words from Psalm 112. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be called blessed. And that psalm and the psalm we're about to sing remind us that those who hear and who heed God's word find life and blessing in doing so. Words from Psalm Psalm. 19, the heavens above declare. Shall we stand? Let's sing together. The heavens above declare the glory of our God and what his hands have made the skies proclaim abroad day after day speech and night by night their knowledge teach. There 
Please do sit. We're going to pray, and here comes Richard to lead us in our prayers. Let's pray. Our Father God, we give thanks that we just need to look around us. We see nature proclaiming your creative power, your glory, your splendor, your majesty and might. We thank you, Lord, for this. We thank you, Lord, that you are not like us, that you are awesome, that you are high and lifted up, that you are light, that you are perfect, and that there is no darkness in you. We thank you, Lord, that you supply our every need, that day in, day out, you give us everything that we need, life itself, the air we breathe, food, clothing, and health and strength. We thank you, Lord God, for the freedoms we have to meet and to listen to your word, to hear it preached and to do so without fear, without fear of being taken to prison, of being killed. And Lord God, we would again ask and pray that this will be our privilege until the end of time. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together this evening and we pray that you will bless our service, that you will help us to raise our voices in praise to you, that you will humble our hearts and that you'll help us to hear and understand your word. Open our hearts and minds to it, Lord. Lord, if we need rebuking, we pray that we will take this on board. We pray that if we need upbuilding, that, Lord, you will speak to our hearts and souls. We pray that you'll bless Davi as he preaches, Lord. We just thank you that you have given us men who can preach well and preach powerfully, Lord. And we do ask and pray that this will be a powerful witness, not just in this town, but across Murrayshire. That, Lord God, you will move in this area. That you will open the hearts of men, women and children to their need of a saviour. Lord God, at the start of a week, we pray for the events that are planned for our church for this week. We pray for the joint prayer meeting on Wednesday with Elgin. We pray that that will go well, that it will be well attended, and that it will be uh, another stepping stone in strengthening the links between our two congregations. We pray also for the outdoor service next week, Lord. We pray, Lord God, could we pray for good weather and for you to lay on our hearts people to invite to this service. We pray that it will be well attended and that again, Lord, it will be a means whereby men, women and children will come to know you for the first time. Lord God, we pray for the youth work of this congregation, for pathfinders and for the links we have with Rooted and with the church camps, Lord. We pray that you will bless all these, um, these outreach uh, things and that, again, Lord, that you will be speaking to the young folks in our congregation. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless Davy and Emma as they go to lead the Oswestry camp and uh, that, again, you'll bless that camp and all the other camps that are running this summer, Lord, as they introduce young people to the gospel, that it will hit home, Lord, that these children will, will know you and will come to know you through the works of the camps. Bless these camps, we pray, Lord. Lord God, as we cast our eyes further, further afield, we look at our world and sometimes we can get dismayed at what's going on. We bring before you again the conflict in Ukraine and Lord God, we just pray for a miraculous ending to this conflict. Humanly speaking, Lord, we can't see how this is going to end, but we know that you are in control, Lord, and all things are happening as part of your plan. Our Father God, we just pray and ask that you will intervene and that you'll bring this to an end. And Lord, we think also of India and Bangladesh who have been hit with floods. We pray, Lord, and ask that you will be with aid agencies who are trying to reach those most um, cut off and that you will, again, be in that situation. We just thank you, Lord, that we can pray to a big God, that all these things are not out with your, your sight and without your control and we just pray and ask, Lord, and leave these things with you. Just ask, Lord, and pray that you'll go before us now and that you will bless us. Forgive us for all that we have done wrong. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand again as we sing? When peace like a river attends. So 
reading tonight is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading the whole chapter 1 through to 27. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this is what is written for us. Because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. 
Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me for I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though my, I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one, not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. For the prize. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all this evening. Um, please do keep that passage open in your Bibles. Um, and really do, because I forgot to put some verses up on the screen, so you will need your Bibles open uh, this time around. Um, let me pray very quickly just before we start. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are before you now as you speak to us through your holy word. Bless us through it, Father. Teach us, we pray. And would we be blessed by its proclamation and its hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me begin uh, this evening by uh, reading to you from the British Citizen Award Honour Roll of 2020. It's a couple of years out of date. Um, these are awards that were handed out to British citizens um, who have gone above and beyond in their service for others in this country. As you listen to a couple of these, and you listen to the lives and the actions of these people, pay attention to how you feel. Doreen is dedicated to serving the local community. She's 74 years old and has volunteered for various causes for over a decade. Every single day for the past five years, Doreen has attended Tandred Heights, a local elderly care home, visiting the residents, sitting, chatting with them, assisting with meals. Doreen's work has contributed positively to the psychological well-being of the elderly people she visits. There's Doreen. Here's another one. After retirement 25 years ago, BB started volunteering weekly at the Citizens Advice Bureau. This continued until recently. But rather than resting on her laurels, she undertook other volunteering roles spending many hours each week going out in all weathers 
despite being nearly 85 years old and having limited mobility. Bibi has served her community for many years. How do you feel after listening to those stories? Quite inspiring, aren't they? Perhaps even moving. Here's another one. Paul of Tarsus, since his conversion a few years ago, volunteers all of his time to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. He is so committed to making sure that gospel message is heard without hindrance, he provides his service pro bono. He is happy to relocate regularly and go wherever that gospel has not been proclaimed before. He happily adapts to cultures around him, even in his um, growing age. Not having a wife or any family commitments, Paul is free to plant and lead churches and write letters with all of his time. On top of all of that, he even ensures that his personal godliness remains intact. Paul is never happier than when people hear the gospel and are saved for eternity so that they get to share with him in the great blessings of the gospel he already enjoys. How do you feel about Paul? Remember, we're in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. The Corinthian the Corinthian church were wondering about how they should engage with the idolatrous world around them. The issue, the pressing issue was food offered to idols. And it was everywhere. Are Christians allowed to eat it? What should they do with it? Last week, we were challenged by Paul to think of the weaker brother. Paul affirmed that idol meat was nothing and false idols are nothing. But if going to the temple... To eat such food is going to tempt a weak brother or a sister back into an idolatrous, sinful lifestyle. Well, then he was happy to give up those, those rights and those privileges for the sake of that brother, to keep them safe. Tonight, in chapter 9, it seems like Paul takes a break from talking about uh, food offered to the idols and start, instead start, starts talking about something completely different. But... It is absolutely relevant what he says tonight. His experience, his thoughts, his feelings in Christian ministry need to be known by the Corinthian church. Why? Well, because he's trying to convince them that to give up your rights and your freedoms for the good of others is a really, really genuinely wonderful thing to do. It keeps the weaker brother safe. And what we'll see this week is that it actually might even possibly, can you imagine, save people for an eternity. It's a wonderful thing to do. It's a great way to live your life. Doreen and Bibi, they were retired. They could do anything they wanted with the years that they had left. Instead, they volunteered all of their time, their money, their energy, for the sake of others. Paul does the same. But the prospect is much more exciting than just kind of companionship or, or advice. It's salvation for eternity. To Paul, that is absolutely worthwhile giving up his rights and freedoms it's a no-brainer for him. It just makes sense. Hopefully we'll see that as we follow um, on in the headings that we've got on our sheets. They'll come up on the screen as well. Let's work through the passage and see um, how Paul tries to convince these Corinthian Christians that his way of living is a really good and wise way of living. First point, Paul will gladly give up his rights to present the gospel free. Paul begins in verses 1 and 2. 
by reminding the Corinthian Christians of the legitimacy of his apostleship. The answer to all those rhetorical questions, am I not free, am I not an apostle, have I not seen the Lord Jesus? Well, the answer to all of those is yes. And so, it is absolutely the case that Paul has the same rights as all the other apostles and all the other gospel workers around at the time. Yes, there's food and drink to be enjoyed. Yes, there's a wife to perhaps take, as do some of the Lord's brothers and Cephas. Of course, he's free to work alongside all of this and earn some money for himself. But he doesn't. More than that, Paul <laughs> builds on his point. He has the right to be paid for his gospel work. That's from verses 7 to 14. Beginning there, Paul again begins with another set of rhetorical questions. Um, no one serves as a soldier at his own expense. No one plants a vineyard and doesn't take any food from it. No one tends a flock and doesn't take any milk from it. All these jobs, well, they receive payment, don't they? That's even the case for animals. Paul points to that principle uh, from the Old Testament that expresses the same point. Don't muzzle the ox while it's working. Let it eat as it works. Even the ox gets payment. Even animals expect and have the right to receive some benefit for their labor. And to cover all his bases, it's not the case that this rule doesn't apply if you're doing spiritual things. It is absolutely right for there to be material harvest from spiritual seed. Paul points to other religions. And he says, even to them that's a given. Verse 13. Let me find it very quickly. Yes, um, don't all those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? All those who serve at the altar share what is off offered in the altar. So Paul concludes... Rightly and convincingly. Verse 14. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. It's a pretty thorough argument. It's covered all those bases. But, there's a big but. Look at verse 12. We did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than to hinder, rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul had every right to take payment from this church, but he doesn't. And the question on our lips and in our minds has to be, why? Why not? Here's what he says in verse 15 onwards. Look, I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. He's not looking for money. I'd rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. A reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Now, these verses are a little bit convoluted. Things are a bit all over the place. But put very simply, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is simply telling us that offering the gospel free of charge so that there's nothing in the way that would hinder it is the best, most exciting most wonderful thing for him. That in itself is a reward for Paul. He lives in such a way that no one can say that he preaches only because he's paid to do it. He lives in a way so that no one can say that he preaches only because it's in his contract to do it. No, Paul simply loves to make the gospel freely available he just loves it it's the best thing in the world for him that's what he boasts in that's the boast that he has 
living like this, foregoing these rights of payment, of family, of other work. Here's the point. It's not a horrible grind for Paul. It's not a horrible grind for him. It's his pleasure. It's his reward. Giving up his rights so that other people may listen to the gospel freely. That is the best thing that Paul can do. And he loves doing it. And so he's glad not to take a payment. He's glad not to take a wife. He's glad not to do any other work on the side. It means that the gospel can go out freely. Now, Paul refuses to be paid by the Corinthian church. I think most, most likely because he does not want to be likened to all the other philosophical speakers of the time. Remember, Corinth loved a good speaker. And so he wanted to stand out from that culture and that practice. Paul could have received payment. He had every right to. But he didn't want to. Because his message was not to be likened to all the other philosophers in their messages. Who got paid for their speaking. He wanted to stand out. He wanted to make sure that the gospel went out without hindrance. If people were wondering or thinking that Paul was like all the other philosophers then they would not have um, properly grasped the importance of the gospel. Paul could not have people think that the gospel was just another paid-for message and that he was not just another paid-for messenger. He would have nothing hindered the impact of the message. So to him, it was right not to take any payment. That meant that the gospel went out unimpeded. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, remember chapter 11, verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Paul makes explicit what we are to do with his teaching in this section. We are to imitate him, follow his example as he follows the example of Christ. We are to make the gospel free. We are to proclaim it without hindrance. We're going to see what that looks like in practice in the next few verses. But I think first and foremost, Paul just wants the Corinthian Christians to grasp his thinking, his motivations, his heart. Do we appreciate what Paul is doing here as much as we appreciate Doreen and Bibi? Does it make sense to you that Paul is willing to live this way? Does it? Paul denies himself perfectly legitimate rights if they would get in the way of anyone having an opportunity to respond to the gospel. So here are some questions for us. Big life questions. What are your goals in life? What do you want out of it? What do the next five to ten years look like? What do you plan for retirement? If you are retired, what do you plan to spend your days doing? Does making sure that the gospel is going out freely fall into your list of priorities? Does seeing people in Barkhead come to saving faith How does that place in your thinking as you plan your life out for the next few years? These big and eternal considerations are standard for Paul. They shape his life. They should be standard considerations for us. Now, hopefully we've got the big overarching principle in place. Paul goes on to unpack what that means in everyday life. Here's what it looks like. Though Paul is absolutely free, he will gladly enslave himself 
to any culture, wherever he is, so that people will be able to hear the gospel. Here's point number two. Paul will gladly enslave himself to win people. Let's read verses 19 to 23. There's no slide for this, so you're going to have to actually look at the Bibles. Here we go. Verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not, ha- not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. The language is stark once more. Paul is clear that he is free. He is an apostle. He has rights. But he will make himself a slave if that helps to win people. That is to save people. That means that in practice, he chooses to fit around others and put his own preferences to the side. For Paul, that meant going to the synagogue one day and then the Areopagus in another. It meant voluntarily submitting himself to some Jewish customs one day and then completely ignoring them in the other. Now, of course, Paul will not sin. He says, he says so. He's still under Christ's law but he will genuinely and gladly adjust his clothing, his food habits, his living locations, so that people would be one, so that they may be saved. And here's the kicker. He's not going to enjoy all of those adjustments equally, but he will do them. What might it look like to have Paul's big life perspective in our everyday practice. It looks like putting aside preferences and taking other things on proactively so that others may hear the gospel. Here's a question for us. Do you have anyone that you could talk to about the gospel, about the Bible, or about Jesus right now? Who doesn't know him? Is there anyone like that in your life? If the answer is no, wouldn't it be great to? And guess what? We can make it. So that is the case. Can you imagine winning people for salvation in eternity with the time that we have on earth? That is a wonderful prospect. Yes, it's nice to have a cozy house. Yes, it's nice to have holidays and trips. All that stuff is not wrong to enjoy. But can you imagine? Can you imagine? Instead of that, winning people for save, for salvation, eternity with the Lord. That is a wonderful, wonderful prospect. What can we do to that end? Here's one thing to keep in mind. Firstly, why don't we do things with people who aren't Christians? Perhaps you already have a hobby or two. Most of us do. Perhaps you're already part of a a community group. If you aren't, join one. Why not make sure that you go to all the meetings? Maybe you can take on some responsibility and help lead that group. Yes, it's nice to be by ourselves. Yes, it's not wrong to enjoy leisure and hobbies and, you know, that way, by ourselves or with people who are already Christians, but doing it with non-believers means that there may be a chance that they'll listen to the gospel and be saved. What a wonderful prospect. Secondly, how about we try maybe going to places and doing things with non-believers even if we aren't interested in those things? 
Now, there are lots of community groups in Birkhead. I'm sure Paul would have been involved in lots of them. And he would not have enjoyed them all equally. Bowling, I'm sure, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it would have been up his street, but maybe not. But there are lots of people at the bowling club who may well respond positively to the gospel. So, Paul would say, well, to the bowlers, I became a bowler so that I might win some. To the pub goers, I became a pub goer. To the dancing group and the dancers, well, I became like a dancer. To the gardeners, I became a gardener. To the historians, I became interested in history. So that by all possible means, I might save some. Just an aside here, some people might say at this point, well, there may well be some Christians already at these groups. So I'm not going to bother. To that attitude, I think there are two things to say. Firstly, having some other Christians there already makes it easier to join in with stuff that you wouldn't necessarily enjoy. So that shouldn't put you off. That actually should help you to join in. Second thing to say is that it's absolutely the case that it's less and less likely nowadays that unbelievers will walk through these doors for events or for services. They will most likely walk through those doors for people. Personal invitations from friends and family. Multiplying the number of Christians a non-believer knows and is good friends with is absolutely worthwhile. A non-believer is more likely to take the gospel seriously if they know multiple people who think it's true rather than just the one odd person that they get to ignore. They will respond more positively to multiple invitations, not just one. They will feel better about coming along if they know more than one friendly face is going to be there. If there are groups of Christians in a certain context, instead of just one Christian in that context, suddenly the faith doesn't seem so strange and it's not so easy to ignore. So join in with the groups, even if there are Christians already there. Another way of putting this into practice is just by mixing your groups of, your, your, the people you know, the groups of non-Christian and Christian friends together. Um, birthday parties, celebrations, sporting events, we've got a World Cup coming up. Great opportunities for your Christian friends and your non-believing friends to meet. Again, suddenly the gospel doesn't seem so strange. Look at all these people. They all believe Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe I should take that seriously. Third way of applying Paul's big life principles and practical day-to-day -day practice is to be intentional with the non-believing contacts that you have. Remember, Paul does all of these things not to have lots of friends, Paul does all of these things to win people. Yes, it's nice to be friendly and to be polite, but we need to cross that pain threshold at some point and mention Jesus, the church, or the gospel. When or how, well, that depends. But it needs to happen. You could say something like, well... Do you know, John, I've known you for a long time. And this may be a bit strange, but we get along really well, and I want you to really know me. And for that, you need to understand that I'm a Christian. I'd love to tell you a little bit about that. You know, if the person's your friend, they're not going to walk away from you. People are polite, mostly. <laughs> Or you can um, mention something when someone asks you about what you were doing at the weekend. Well, I went for a walk on Saturday, saw the kids. 
And then on Sunday in church, we were thinking about where we could find true satisfaction in life. And you could leave it there. There probably is a question coming after that, isn't there? Now, there's lots more that could be said about this. Please keep talking about it. Share with one another how you have implemented these principles in the past, how you might do it just now. And remember, living like this, it grates against our individualism and our constant striving for comfort, but it's genuinely worth it. Look how Paul puts it at the end of this section. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul's looking forward to sharing the blessings of the gospel with other people who he witnessed to. Resurrection will come. Can you imagine this? Think about this for a second. Can you imagine this? Resurrection will come. And maybe someone you went out of your way to meet, to speak to, to become friends with is resurrected to new life alongside you. such an exciting prospect. It's what Paul lived for. It's what he lived for. Can you imagine that? It's wonderful. It's the example that we are to follow. Now, someone might say to Paul, really? You go to that pub? That's a dodgy pub. Or really, you'd go to that part of town? That's a dodgy part of town. Or really, you'd go to that nightclub or that party? Or really, you'd go into the synagogue? That's where the Jews are. Or really, you'd go to that person's house for dinner? Of course, what's behind all these questions is that these places are not suitable for Christians. But don't you see, we need to be careful here. We can't just jump into the holy huddle That's a mistake that Paul will not make. His approach is really that extreme. Like Jesus, Paul will really go to dinner with sinners. And he will really eat with prostitutes and tax collectors. He really will become all things to all people that he might save some. However, of course, it's true that Paul is not Jesus. And neither are we. We're on to point three. We are prone to sin. And we are susceptible to temptation. Paul is not ignorant of that. And so he will be disciplined in his evangelistic efforts. He will not allow himself to fall into sin. He will not use evangelism as a justification for dips in holiness and godliness. Instead, He will be self-controlled so that he will definitely, definitely win the eternal prize. Look at what he says in verses 25 to 27. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. And make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul does not want all of these evangelistic efforts to go to waste. He does not run aimlessly here, there, and everywhere. He doesn't just punch wildly at the air. He's disciplined. He's focused with his efforts so that they produce the desired outcome. The desired outcome is other people getting saved and me being there with them. He wants that prize that the gospel offers for others, and he wants it for himself too. And so Paul will become a pub goer to all the pub goers, but he will not indulge in drunkenness. He won't. He will remain distinct in that way. He will happily oblige to all sorts of Jewish practices, but he won't become a Jew. He will not be influenced into regular sin because he wants to make sure that his eternity is secure. This is the perspective that truly, eternally safe Christian believers have. In the same breath, 
They take the warnings of Scripture absolutely seriously. They leave no room for complacency in sin. And yet, at the same time, they can recount with certainty all of the assurances of salvation found in Scripture. That is what truly safe Christians are like. No complacency in sin. True joy and assurance of the future. Let me finish by giving a quick example of this kind of um, thing. Now, um, often sports societies at universities, they'll put new members through some initiation kind of forfeits at these kind of initiation parties. Now, that often involves drinking an awful lot, you can imagine. Now, two of the students that we had uh, in our church down in Edinburgh were really, really good. They were top-class rowers. They were part of the rowing club. One of them, at least, if not both of them, were definitely not the party-going type, you know? I remember speaking to them about these initiation parties that were coming up. Now, they knew that if they didn't go, they would not be accepted by the teams. They'd be outcasts for the rest of their university career. But at the same time, though they didn't want to go, they knew they had to go, they didn't want to get drunk. They wanted to be distinct and to obey their Lord Jesus. So what did they do? Well, they spoke to the guys organizing those parties and they said, look, we, don't, we know what these forfeits involve. We don't want to get drunk, but we're still willing to go through the initiation process because we want to be part of the club. What can we do instead? And they agreed that what they would do instead is get all of their hair completely shaved off and go completely bald. And they agreed. So they went to the party. They met everyone. They became part of the club. One of the guys ended up living with lots of those rowers. One of them came to church. A few of them went to Christian Union events. Paul has become all things to all people, that by all possible means I might save some. Paul is happy to forgo his rights and his preferences if it means the gospel gets heard unimpeded by all sorts of different people. He will do whatever it takes. He'll get his head shaved without sinning. He follows Jesus' example, who went and spoke and sat with all sorts of different people from every, every background and gave them all the best opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. What a great way to lead a life. Wonderful way to lead a life. May we be more like him and more like Paul. Let's pray. Please do just take a second to meditate upon what the Lord might have been saying to us tonight. What then is my reward? Just this, simply this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge. <clears throat> Father, we know that to the world outside, living like this seems foolish. To the world outside, giving up rights, and freedoms and preferences for others seems on the whole absurd. And yet, Father, we know that your wisdom is not like the world's wisdom. And so would you help us embed within us an eternal perspective 
that sees the salvation of others as the most wonderful, wonderful thing. Forgive us, Father, for our complacency and help us more and more to be effective witnesses to all those in Burkhead, not just those who we know. Please, Father, with these teachings that we have heard tonight be embedded into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing once more in response to all of this of the goodness of our Lord. Let's stand and sing together. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken, though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my As we stand, one last prayer. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. Please do take a seat. There will be some tea and coffee served at the back. Stick around. We'd love to chat and thank you for coming and God bless.